Let's go ahead and get started. So I thought that the first thing that I would do is um, go over the homework assignment for this week. We've already covered all the material that you need to know in order to do it. And hopefully it'll be fairly straightforward. Can you see this with the lights on? Okay. Um, all right, so there are six problems. And um, the first one is to report how many permutations are there of 200 distinguishable objects. So that should be obvious from the notes, how to get such a, a number. And then the second one um, has to do with the binomial coefficient. So that's how many ways can you take 200 distinguishable objects and divide them into two groups, one containing 150 and the other containing 50 without regard to the order. <coughs> and then the third one is a calculation similar to some of the examples we've done in class where you use essentially the binomial distribution to calculate the probability of getting uh, 40 heads in um, 100 flips of a fair coin. And then in um, number four, what I'd like you to do is plot the probability of getting exactly m heads in 200 coin flips as a function of uh, the number m. Okay, so again, that's an ex there's an example very similar to that in the, um, in the notes. And uh, I've advised you to use the option plot range arrow all so that you get a full plot of your um, function as opposed to just part of it. Okay, then uh, number five, there's a couple of things to do. So there is, um, on the homework web page, there's a file called chem1a final scores dat. It's final exam scores from a chem1a class and uh, two columns of data. The first column is just a number of a student, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And the second one is the corresponding scores. So what I want you to do is import that file uh, into a matrix. And then um, I want you to report the minimum, maximum, median, mean, and standard deviation. Okay? And then um, make a raw histogram. So just the raw counts um, using a bin width of two. That's part B. And then in part C, I want you to do a couple of things. So first, make a probability density histogram from those scores and it says to use 40 bins, okay? And then you want to assign that to some variable and then uh, make a separate plot which is a normal distribution that has the mean and standard deviation of the distribution of scores, okay? And uh, save that plot as uh, as also a variable, and then use the show command to uh, put them on top of each other. And the thing I want you to look for here is whether or not you think the normal distribution uh, accurately represents the distribution of scores in, in this particular Chem1A class. Okay, so you can make a comment about that um, at the end of the problem. Okay, last problem is um, you're going to plot molecular orbitals. Okay, using uh, three-dimensional plotting techniques. All right, so you all remember, I'm sure, from your GCAM, uh, the uh, concept of molecular orbitals. So molecular orbitals is a way to describe the electronic structure in molecules and uh, the version of the molecular orbital theory that you learn in general chemistry is the so-called so LCAOMO model, which is, stands for linear combination of atomic orbitals. So the idea is that each atom in the molecule contributes some atomic orbitals and then those go into a hat and uh, abracadabra occurs and out of the hat comes um, the same number of orbitals but now uh, distributed over the molecule. And you may recall that uh, the way those orbitals are combined, the atomic orbitals are combined in the molecular orbitals, you end up with um, so-called bonding and anti-bonding combinations. Okay, you could also get non-bonding combinations. 
Okay, so what you're going to do here is you're going to plot um, the molecular orbitals that come from combining two hydrogen 1s orbitals into molecular orbitals for the H2 plus ion. All right, and so what you get is two molecular orbitals. One is a sigma uh, called sigma 1s, so it has cylindrical symmetry along the bond axis and uh, it's a bonding combination. And in Cartesian coordinates, the functional form is like this. This isn't exactly it, but uh, it, it will give you the right shape, okay? And then there's um, a non-bonding or an anti-bonding combination that is the same thing except instead of adding them together, we actually subtract them, the two terms, okay? So these are basically just uh, s-orbital-like functions, all right? And here D is the uh, bond length and the units here are in Bohr radius, but you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so I want you to use D equal 2.5 and then make separate plots of each of these functions using plot 3D. And you should recognize them because you've seen them in your general chemistry textbooks, or you should have anyway. All right. Now, uh, so that's part A. And I, I tell you what ranges to plot the, the functions over in plot 3D. And then I want you in parts B and C to make uh, contour plots and density plots of uh, not the orbitals themselves, but the, their squares, which are uh, proportional to the probability density of finding the electron in, in the, at a particular, particular region in space. And um, there's slightly different ranges here. And in part C for the density plot, I ask you to um, change the color scheme to gray tones. Okay, so that's the, the homework for this week. Um, does anybody have any questions on that? No. Okay. Well, so uh, we're going to continue today uh, with plotting and um, I want to just to quickly summarize what we've done so far in terms of plotting. Okay, so we have plotted functions or data of the form y equals f of x. So here we have a single uh, independent variable here. This gives us um, a two-dimensional plot and we've seen how to do this with uh, the plot command and also uh, the list plot command for discrete data. Okay. And then more recently, um, we learned how to plot three-dimensional functions of two variables and we have three ways of doing that which you will explore in the homework. So one is uh, plot 3D and then we also have um, contour plot and density plot. Okay, now today uh, to finish up our plotting, we're going to learn how to represent at least partially functions that have this form. So how many dimensions is this function or surface uh, S going to be? One variable, two dimensions, two variables, three dimensions, three variables, four dimensions. It's not a trick question. Okay. Now, I see you kind of wondering, well, how are we going to do that? Can anybody see in four dimensions? If you can, uh, you're unique. How about do they make uh, four-dimensional glasses like they do uh, for three-dimensional movies? Mm -mm. Well, so then this, uh, this is a little strange, right? Because you've certainly seen depictions of functions like this. 
how many dimensions does an electron in an atom move in? Three. And uh, then how is it that we can depict an orbital in a textbook? You've all seen the pictures, right? There's pictures of orbitals. So you're seeing a representation of a four-dimensional function. But what you're actually seeing, see, is a contour plot. So remember when we, we could plot three-dimensional functions in two different ways, right? We can display the whole three-dimensional surface or we can make a two-dimensional plot of a three-dimensional function by drawing its contours. So that's the trick to seeing uh, a picture of, say, an orbital, which is a four-dimensional function represented as a three-dimensional object. It's actually a contour plot, which you look at when you see those pictures. Okay? And there is a command in Mathematica, which we're going to use, and we'll use it to visualize atomic orbitals, which is called Contour Plot 3D. All right, now, so what are we actually going to draw with that? Well, like I said, we're going to draw um, atomic orbitals. Okay, so those of you who are uh, taking PCHEM right now, you're learning how to solve the Schrodinger equation. And pretty soon, you'll talk about how that's done for the electron, the problem of the electron in the hydrogen atom, and you'll see the hydrogen-like orbitals um, emerging from that. And you'll find that uh, using, say, x, y, and z is not the most convenient set of coordinates for solving that problem. Okay? You're going to find that it's the distance from the nucleus as well as a couple of angles. And so the functions that you're going to be looking at are going to be functions of r, theta, and phi. r being the distance and theta and phi being two angles. Now. Uh, once you have those orbitals, you can write down Cartesian versions of them. So Cartesian coordinates are x, y, and z. And that's what we're actually going to plot here so that we don't have to worry about um, all the special functions that arise in, in the case of r, theta, and phi. Okay? So we're going to write um, orbital-like functions. And you'll see they have uh, more or less the correct shapes. So orbital-like functions, um, they're going to be functions of the Cartesian coordinates. And they're going to be in the following form, a constant, which we'll ignore, times uh, a function g of, I'll call it R, and H of X, Y, and Z. Okay? And R here is the distance um, measured from the origin, which is X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared square root. Okay? And the functions that we're going to consider today as examples are as follows. So we're going to consider something that looks like a 1s. In that case, uh, g is equal to e to the minus r. This is going to be in units of Bohr radius. And h is equal to 1. Okay? And then we're also going to look at the 2pz. Do you remember what the 2pz orbital looks like? It's like a dumbbell. Uh huh. Has two lobes, and which axis is it aligned with? Yeah. Okay. So this one's going to be e to the minus r over two again in units of Bohr radius, the distances, and h is going to be equal to z. 
And then we're going to look at uh, the 3 d z squared orbital. So you remember what that one looks like? That's the d orbital that looks somewhat like a 2p, except it has the same sign in both lobes, unlike the 2p. And then it has the donut around the xy plane. Okay, and so for that one, g is equal to e to the minus r over 3, and h is equal to 3z squared minus r squared. Okay? So these are all going to be uh, four-dimensional functions, and we're going to represent them as three-dimensional contour plots. All right, so I think we have everything we need to get started. All right. Okay. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to define the distance, r, as a function of x, y, and z. Okay, so I'm going to say r bracket x underscore y underscore z underscore bracket colon equals square root x squared plus y squared plus z squared. All right, so then once I have that, I can use it over and over. Okay. Now, for the 1s orbital, then, I'm going to say f of x, y, and z colon equals e caret minus r of x, y, and z. Okay. Now, the contour plot 3D command, so here it is, 3D. You actually have to specify the contour level that you want your function to be drawn at. Okay? And so this is going to introduce us to a new kind of equals, which is the double equals sign. And this is a place where, yes? Oh, I have an X instead of a Y. Thank you. That would have been a pretty uh, funny looking thing. Thank you very much. And okay, so what we do then is we say, what do we want to plot? Well, we're going to plot F of X, Y, and Z, and then we need to specify the value, okay? Now, if you look at the function that we're plotting, you can see that it's exponentially decreasing with r, okay? So as x, y, and z get bigger and r gets bigger, this function dies off exponentially. And you can also see that it goes between values of 1 and then as r goes to infinity, it will be uh, 0. So the contour we choose should be a low value of the function so that we can draw, uh, you know, an envelope that it encompasses, you know, a, a large amount of the function. Okay? And so what I'm going to say is that uh, I'm going to choose the value f equals to 0.1. All right? So it'll be 90% decayed on the contour that we're going to see. All right? Now, to specify that, we have to use double equals. Okay? And if when you're doing these, say, in homework or something next week, if you don't get anything, it might be because you forgot the double equals. So I'm going to set it equal to 0.1, and then I have to specify the ranges of x, y, and z. And uh, this is sometimes done by trial and error, okay? Or if you wanted, you could plug some numbers into um, the function and get a rough idea. But anyway, so for this plot, x going from minus 3 to 3, and the same for y and z works pretty well. Okay. 
All right, so uh, let's go ahead and let it rip. Oops. We need a minus three here, sorry. Okay, now one thing to notice is that uh, there's actually a, a fair amount of calculation going on here because we have to evaluate the function and uh, find out where it actually equals the contour. Okay. Anyway, at the end of the day, you get something that looks like a sphere centered at the origin. And uh, sure enough, that's what we know uh, the 1s orbital to actually look like. Okay? Now, uh, what if you wanted to see more of the function? Well, you could, um, you could lower the, the contour a bit. Say, we'll point uh, 0.05. What's that going to do? Is it going to make the sphere bigger or smaller? Well, what it means is we'll be going out to ours where the function is decayed even more, so it'll be a bigger surface, right? The smaller the value of the function, the bigger the surface will be. All right, see, so it grew. All right, and if you want, you can uh, grab this guy and move it around. And um, it's also helpful when you're drawing these to, uh, to put in some axes. So let's go ahead and put in uh, axes labels. And so I'll just say x, y, and z. Oops, we need a curly. All right, so there you have it. So now you can see in four dimensions, sort of. You can see a shadow in four dimensions. Okay, uh, the shadow of a four-dimensional function, basically. All right, so I want to take this uh, opportunity to show you something that some of you may have already discovered or needed to use, but um, it does occasionally become useful when you're doing number-intensive things like these contour plots because from time to time, the Mathematica kernel gets screwed up and um, it's useful to know how to stop it and restart it um, so that uh, you can continue your work. So sometimes if, you know, Mathematica is not responding or you think you've put something in correctly and um, you're not getting a result, uh, this is something that you may try um, in order to make sure that it's not your code and that it's just something going on with the Mathematica kernel. So the, the engine that uh, underlies the, the program Mathematica is called the kernel. And uh, the way to turn that off and restart it is as follows. So you go under evaluation and you go down here to quit kernel and select local. Come on. And then you say, yes, I really want to quit. Okay. So now Mathematica is dead. Okay. And if you want to start working again, you go down and say start kernel local. Okay, and that basically fires it back up. And then if you want to uh, reevaluate your notebook, you could say evaluate notebook. And then it'll just go through and um, redo everything that you had done. And that way you can see if you still have a, any issue. Um, you, you know, this is something that you might want to try from time to time when you're having problems and you don't think it's anything to do with your, your commands. Okay. Now, um, so this, this here is a, a beautiful 1s orbital and I, I imagine that a lot of you are probably a little underwhelmed at the moment, so, so let's do the 2pz. It's a little more interesting. All right, so let's just go ahead and mouse all this F and contour plot stuff in. Okay. And put it back. All right, now uh, we have to modify the function a little bit. So first of all, we'll put in the um, R over 2 here. And just to make sure everything's done correctly, we'll put this in parentheses. And then we just have to multiply out in front by z. Okay. Now, uh, I think we're otherwise okay for the time being. 
So let's go ahead and um, enter that. And we should see, in principle, a 2p z orbital. Now, that doesn't look like a 2p z orbital, does it? Does anybody think it does? Okay, so what's the deal? Well, one of the deals is you remember that uh, as uh, the principal quantum number uh, of the electron in the hydrogen atom increases, uh, its orbits become larger. Okay, so one thing we could suppose is that we're only seeing a piece of the function here because 2pz orbital is bigger for a given value of the function than is a, a 1s. So we should certainly uh, increase the ranges over which we're, we're looking at the function. Okay? And so, uh, for example, we might increase these values to 10 Bohr radii instead of 3. All right. All right. So let's try that. All right, still cut off, but we can fix that by just putting in 0.1 instead of 0.05, so we'll see a little less of the function. But you can already see that this does not look like a 2pz orbital, does it? So what's the deal? It looks like we're only looking at half. Well, we are only looking at half. You may recall from G-Chem or from uh, organic chemistry where uh, these kind of knowing something about the sign of the lobes of the orbitals, one of these lobes has a positive amplitude and the other one has a negative amplitude. So we're only looking at the positive one here because we specified a positive value for the contour. Okay, if we want to see the whole thing, we need to plot another surface to go with this one that uh, corresponds to the, neg the lobe with negative amplitude. Okay, so let's, we can fix that pretty easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to put in a curly bracket here and we're going to plot this positive one along with a negative one that has the same contour level. Okay, so I'm just going to put a minus sign in here and then a curly bracket, okay? All right, so we can let that rip and now we should see a 2pz orbital. Okay, so now there we have something that looks more like the 2pz orbital that we know and love and it's still not that pretty because um, we've plotted the surfaces with the same colors and so it might be informative if we're trying to explain to somebody uh, about the signs of the lobes of a 2p orbital, it might be informative to color the two uh, lobes uh, different colors. Okay, so we can do that using um, directives as we did previously for three-dimensional plots. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is make a nicer looking plot by uh, turning off the mesh okay, so the mesh will be gone and now I'm going to uh, specify some details of the contour style, okay? So for this um, I'm going to use directives to make these shiny surfaces with different colors for the positive lobe and the negative lobe. Okay, so for the first one I'll say directive and I'll make this one green and then I'll change the specularity to make it a nice shiny solid looking surface. So I'll say uh, white 100, we saw this previously. Okay, so that's for the first one. And then for the second, I'll 
do the same except I'll make it a different color. Okay, so we'll change this, say, to uh, yellow. All right. So the first directive applies to the positive contour surface, so that'll be green, the upper one. And then the second directive will change the negative contour surface to yellow. All right, so let's see if that works. Aha. They worked. So now you have a picture that's worthy of being put into a GCAM textbook. Okay. All right. Now let's do the 3DZ squared. Okay. Any questions on this so far? Just scroll up or down? Um, do you have the same ranges? Did you put e to the minus r over 2? Do you have the z? Maybe uh, Krista can, can check it? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. So the double equals is the way that we um, specify the value at which we want the contour to be drawn. Okay. And the double equals, it's just the Mathematica syntax. And we'll see additional uses of that later on. It's sort of like saying, um, it's sort of like saying, making a special case, right? Saying, I want the function evaluated at that, well, I want to represent the function that when it's equal to precisely that value. Okay? All right, and that's a, that's a source of uh, some headaches because sometimes you forget to put that in and then it's hard to see because notice this double equals here um, has a very tiny little space in there that makes it hard to, to see that it's actually a double equals. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's move on to the uh, 3DZ squared. And so let's go ahead and grab all this stuff. Put it down here. Okay, so now we need a slightly more complicated function. So we'll say uh, e to the minus r over 3. And then in front, we're going to have 3 times z squared minus r of x, y, and z, parentheses, okay? And we have to increase the limits because now we're moving up another principal quantum number. And so I'm going to go ahead and put in 30. Okay, and so now we'll draw the surfaces in the same way as before. The positive lobe will be, or the positive part of it will be green, and the negative part will be yellow. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Okay, something looks a little weird there. Aha, so 
notice it's 3z squared minus r squared and I have only r, okay? So we need to fix that. So this should be r of x, y, and z squared. It will be worth the wait. Okay. So there you have it. Does that look familiar? More or less? Like I say, these uh, functions that we're plotting, these are not exactly the functions describing the orbitals. They're just, uh, they're close and they, they're giving a reasonable depiction of the shape. Okay? So that looks kind of like the, 3dz squared and from this we can be reminded that in the in this orbital um, the part that's aligned along the z-axis that looks a little bit like a p orbital uh, is actually all positive amplitude and the donut going around it in the xy plane is uh, negative amplitude. And if you want you can change the colors easily so for example suppose we wanted to call this or paint this one red and this one blue we could do that. Just have to wait. Okay, so while we're waiting, I'll tell you that uh, there's another way that we can, well, there are other convenient ways to depict functions such as this. Okay, so there you have it. Maybe you like that better if you're feeling patriotic today. Um, Okay, so, so this is the way we draw three-dimensional contour surfaces, contour plots of four-dimensional functions. Now, you've probably also seen in your textbooks other um, useful representations of the orbitals drawn as um, contour plots but, through, but showing a plane cutting through the orbitals. So I want to show you that because th those make nice looking diagrams also. So this is taking the three-dimensional contour of the four-dimensional surface but we can also now take slices through this guy and look at two-dimensional representations of it. So for example, I could come through with a knife and carefully slice through uh, the middle of the thing where y is equal to zero. Okay? And basically eliminate y from the function. So that now I actually would have a function of two variables which I can represent uh, as a three dimensional object using, say, contour plot or density plot. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. All right, so we'll do that with this 3z squared, 3dz squared. And so what I'm going to do is uh, grab up to here. Actually, I want the function to, sorry. All right, so what I want to do now is represent the uh, this orbital as a slice through the uh, xz plane or in the xz plane so that y is gone, okay? So how can I do that? Well, first of all, I can um, define my r now as function of x and z only, all right? So I've removed y from the picture. So that'll be square root of x squared plus z squared. And now f is not a function of y anymore, so we can get rid of that and get rid of it here and get rid of it here. Okay? And now I'm going to use the regular contour plot command 
and plot f of x and z. And I don't need to specify the contour anymore because Mathematica will choose contours for me. I can use the same range and I can get rid of um, the y axis here and then finally put in the bracket here. Oh, I have to get rid of the y limits here too. Okay, so now I think we're ready to see the 3dz squared orbital in the xz plane. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, it's not squared. Thank you. Still got a problem here. Oh, okay, that worked. All right, so then um, it's a little bit screwed up because uh, it didn't show the whole thing. So we can say uh, plot range. arrow all, re, enter, and now you see a nice picture of the 3dz squared orbital but now sliced down along the y equals zero plane so we're in the, the actual xz plane and, and I didn't get labels on my axes because I forgot like I do all the time that the contour plot is drawn with a frame so I have to say frame label. Okay, so now you can see I have x and z. Okay. You want more contours? You can put more contours. Does that look familiar to anybody? Seen plots like that before? You can see the positive lobe drawn with the lighter colors going to its maximum value at the white and then the negative lobe uh, drawn with the, the darker colors here. And of course, uh, you could change the color function and draw it in any wild uh, array of colors that you like. So does everybody understand or uh, everybody understand what it is we just did here? So we drop down another dimension and uh, now we're representing the, the orbital as a three-dimensional object using a two-dimensional contour plot. All right. Okay, so now the last thing I want to show you with regard to plotting then is that um, these types of functions look very nice if you make them into density plots. So let's have a look at what that looks like. All right, so we can get rid of this contours. And change this to density. Okay, so there you have a nice sort of fuzzed up plot that sort of helps you to appreciate the fact that we're, we're plotting a wave amplitude here, um, it's a quantum mechanical object, the electron in the 3dz squared orbital of the hydrogen atom. Okay, so that concludes our plotting lessons. All right, so now we know how to make all kinds of plots and um, in the next homework assignment, you'll get to practice uh, using these representations of the four-dimensional functions. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears now and um, we're going to start to see uh, a new face of Mathematica um, that is um, going to be our introduction to symbolic math. Okay, so actually using Mathematica to do uh, you know, mathematics. And we'll start out with calculus, uh, one dimensional calculus. We'll do derivatives and integrals.
Okay, so this is useful for many things. Um, you may find it to be very helpful in doing your homework or checking your homework uh, sometimes in math classes or PCHEM classes. Uh, so very, very handy. Okay, so to begin uh, here, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page um, with respect to what is the derivative. How is the derivative defined? Okay, so I have a function f equals f of x and now I want to define its first derivative so we'll call it f prime of x actually we could call it y equals f of x and equivalently say dy by dx does anybody remember uh, the definition of the derivative? You take, it's the, it's the local slope, right? If, if it's evaluated at a point, it's the slope of a curve at that point. So we uh, take the value of the function at a particular value x. We subtract that from the function evaluated at a little increment uh, away from x. We divide by that and we take the limit as the little increment goes to zero. Okay. All right, so that's our uh, definition of the derivative. So now let's see how we can do differentiation in Mathematica. All right, so the first thing I'll do is I'll generate a function that we will um, take the derivative of. Okay, so let's say f of x underscore colon equals and it'll be a simple function where we could just, you know, quickly verify the derivatives in our head. So it'll be 2x cubed plus 8 times x squared and then minus 3 times x and then plus 1. Okay, and I'll enter that. All right, now there's different ways to ask for the derivative. So if it's a, a function of one variable like this one, um, you can use the prime notation. So I can just say give me f prime of x. All right, and you see you get minus 3 coming from this term and then you get 16x coming from this term and you get 6x squared coming from this term. Okay. Um, you want the, the second derivative? F double prime. Okay, so that's just taking the derivative of the first derivative. Third derivative? f triple prime. And then finally, if we take the fourth, we should get zero. And we do. Okay. So that's kind of nice. Uh, there's an alternative way to do the derivative. Um, this is a more generally useful um, notation. And uh, that's by using the D command, D standing for derivative. And the way that works is you say D, capital. You specify the function you want to differentiate, so f of x. And then you say um, which variable you want to differentiate with respect to. All right? So this should give the same thing as f prime. And it does. If you want the second derivative using the D command, you say D, function and then in curly braces you say x and then the second derivative with respect to x. All right, so you get the second derivative. And you could do the third by putting in three and the fourth by putting in four. 
Okay, there's uh, yet another way of getting the derivative using the palette. And so for that, we go down here and you can see that there's this little uh, Dell button here. So the way you use that is you push that button. The subscript is the variable you want to differentiate with respect to, so x. And then the other square there is where you put the thing you want to differentiate. So this should give us the first derivative of x. I mean f of x, and it does. Okay, so three different ways of doing the same thing for a simple function of one variable. Now, um, the next thing I want to tell you about is uh, partial derivatives. So when we have a function of more than one variable, we can take derivatives with respect to each of the variables separately or we can um, take the derivative first with respect to one variable and then second with respect to another one. And the way we do that is through partial derivatives. So how many people have had experience with partial derivatives? Most, okay. So uh, just to, to make it clear what we're doing here, um, now we're going to suppose that we have a function f of x and y. Okay? And the notation is as follows. I could take the derivative, partial derivative of f with respect to x and I put a subscript here telling me that while I'm doing that, I consider y to be a constant. Okay? And so that would just be f of x plus h comma y minus f of x, y divided by h, the limit h goes to zero. Okay, so it's just like the one-dimensional version. We just treat y as a constant. And similarly, we could define the partial derivative of f with respect to y holding x con constant. And in that case, we would have x, y plus h. Okay. All right, and then we could also do second derivatives. You can do d squared f by dx squared. You could do d squared f by dy squared. And you could do mixed ones, d squared f dx dy. All right, so I'm going to show you now how to do those using the D command. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and generate a, a function of two variables. So we'll say f of x underscore y underscore colon equals. So this will be three times x to the fourth minus two times y cubed and then plus x squared times y squared. All right. Now, if I want the partial derivative of f with respect to x, I say d f of x comma y and then I just specify I want x. Okay, so y will be treated as a constant now. All right, so there you have it. Does that look right? This term gives the 12x cubed. The second term gives a zero because y is treated as a constant. And then the third term we get six times x times y squared. All right. Uh, another way to do the same thing is we could use this uh, palette. 
we just say we want the derivative with respect to x, and then we can put in f of x and y. And you get the same thing. OK. Now, suppose you want the derivative with respect to y. Well, you just have to change the x to the y in the d command. All right, so now you can see the first term gives 0 because x is constant. The second term gives minus 6y squared. And then the third term gives 2 times x squared y, which you have here. With the palette, just replace x with y. Same thing. All right. Now, next thing we'll do is we'll take the second partial derivative with respect to x. So we can say d f of x comma y comma, and then we say x 2. Bracket. Okay. So what is that? That's the derivative of this guy with respect to x. Okay, so we get 36x squared from the first term and 2y squared from the second term. We could do that with the palette by using the neighboring button here. So this neighboring button is one that's convenient for second derivative. So we could say x tab x tab f of x comma y. And we get the same thing. All right. What about uh, the mixed partial derivatives? So now what I want to do is first take the partial derivative with respect to uh, say x and uh, then take the result of that and differentiate with respect to y. So that would be like d squared f by dx dy. So we could say d f of x comma y. And then we put in the curly brackets x and y. Okay. Oops. What did I do wrong there? Oh, sorry. We don't need the curly brackets. All right, so there's that one. What if I reverse the order? So I say y comma x. I get the same thing. And so that's an important rule for these mixed second partial derivatives is that if those derivatives both exist, then uh, the mixed second partial derivative won't depend on the order of differentiation. All right. Um, let's see how we do that one with the palette. We could just say x tab y, then tab f of x comma y. Same result. Okay, so there you have it some examples of how to do derivatives. Now, what I'd like to do um, next is use differentiation uh, in Mathematica to do a couple of things uh, relevant to physical chemistry problems. Okay, so I'm going to, we'll do, let me explain to you what we're going to do here. Any questions on using the D command or the der derivatives? Pretty straightforward? Okay. So those of you who are in, um, those of you who are in Chem 131A now are learning about uh, quantum mechanics. And you're learning that uh, variables such as 
momentum and kinetic energy that are just numbers uh, or f functions uh, in, in classical mechanics, classical physics, um, can be represented by what are called operators in uh, quantum mechanics, okay? So for example, the momentum. Can one of you tell me what's the momentum operator? This would be the momentum in the x direction, call it px. And the little caret there is meant to indicate that it's an operator, okay? So this thing by itself doesn't mean anything. It, it operates on a function, so for example, the wave function, okay? All right. Uh, what about the... Um, kinetic energy. I have this uh, upside down, don't I? Yeah, it's h bar over i, sorry. Okay. Oh, and by the way, for those of you who haven't seen it before, h bar is the Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Okay, so the kinetic energy, which maybe we could call, say, K, that's defined as the square of the momentum divided by two times the mass of the particle, okay? And what the square here means is that we first operate on the wave function with the momentum operator and then we, we do it again, okay? In this case, uh, we can kind of see what's going to happen. Um, we're going to get h bar squared. The i squared in the denominator is going to give us a minus sign. And then uh, we have divided by 2m. And then we get the second derivative with respect to x. Okay? So those are uh, differential operators in quantum mechanics corresponding to uh, the momentum in the x direction and the kinetic energy, the corresponding kinetic energy. All right, so what we'll do is we'll evaluate those for, um, for our one-dimensional particle in a box, which has the wave function. Psi of x, 2 over L to the 1 half, sine n pi x over L. Now what we're doing here um, is we're just going to ap apply these two guys to this wave function. And those of you who are taking Chem 131A now know that that in itself doesn't produce anything meaningful. In order to produce the actual value of these quantities, we'd have to do more work. But we'll get to that later after we talk a little bit uh, more about once you have uh, probability distributions, how you actually get so-called expectation values out. But for now, we'll just use this as practice for, you know, doing the differentiation on something that's relevant to physical chemistry. Okay. All right. So. What we'll do to begin with is we'll go ahead and, uh, oops, where did that go? Typesetting. We will go ahead and put in a wave function, psi, make it a function of x, colon equals 2 over, I'll use a little l for the length of the box, and then raise that to the one-half power, and then multiply it by sine, oops, n times pi times x divided by the length of the box. Okay? And now we'll evaluate the momentum operator acting on the wave function. Okay? So, I need to put in h bar over i and 
There's the H bar right there, so I can make it look nice. And then I is the capital I. And then I say D psi of X with respect to X. All right, so that gives me the following result. Now, like I say, um, this thing that we just did here is only part of what you would actually be interested in doing if you wanted to evaluate the value of the momentum. But it's just a little exercise of differentiation so that we can see how, you know, we might use it in a, in a real problem. Okay, what about the kinetic energy? All right, well, for that we need minus uh, h bar squared divided by 2m. And I'll put that in parentheses. And now we'll multiply it by d bracket psi of x. And now we need the second derivative. So we say x comma 2. And we probably should put a parenthesis in here. And I need to make sure that I have a star here. Okay. All right, so then now we've seen the result of applying the kinetic energy operator to the wave function for the one dimensional particle in a box. All right. So one of you in Chem 131A, if I actually wanted to evaluate the expectation value of the kinetic energy, the observable value, what would I do next? Well, what I would do next is multiply the complex conjugate of the wave function with the result of applying the kinetic energy operator. In this case, it would be the same as the actual function because it's not a complex function. And then I would integrate over the length of the box. Okay? All right. So there's one example. Now the next thing I want to do is an example from uh, thermodynamics, which uh, those of you who are in Chem 131 now will see, I guess, in spring quarter. So here's what we're going to do. All right, so in thermodynamics, there are a couple of properties, uh, material properties. One is called the uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, and it's given the symbol alpha. So what this is a measure of is how much does the volume change of some substance when I change the temperature and it's defined per unit volume. Okay. So how much does the volume change and, it, and it's uh, for constant pressure. Me, that means dV by dT at constant pressure. Okay. And it's done per unit volume. So the actual definition has 1 over V in front. All right, so if we have an equation of state like the ideal gas equation, for example, where we know how the volume depends on the temperature, we can evaluate this derivative and have an expression for this quantity. All right, another material property is called the uh, isothermal compressibility. It's given symbol kappa. What does compressibility sound like to you? 
does it sound like something like, how much does the volume change when I apply pressure? Does that seem sensible? And the isothermal means constant temperature. Now, what do you suppose the sign of this is? Do things get bigger when you squeeze them? No, they get smaller. So this derivative is in general going to be negative and the quantity itself is defined to be a positive number so it's got a minus sign in front of it and it's also defined per unit volume. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate these for the ideal gas law. Okay? Okay. Now, the details of these are not important to our class. This is just a, a problem where we want to see how to use differentiation to do something relevant to physical chemistry. And those of you who are in Chem 131 will get to do this uh, later on in the year. Okay. So, first thing we'll do is uh, we'll notice that we want to take derivative of volume with respect to both temperature and pressure. Okay, so we're going to define the volume as a function of temperature and pressure. So I'll say V is a function of T and P, colon equals. So what is that going to be for the ideal gas law? N, whoops, little n times R times T divided by P. Okay? And I'm going to start by clearing R because we were using it earlier. Okay, and then we can enter that function. All right, now we want the coefficient of thermal expansion, alpha. So what do we need to do? We take 1 over V times D V of P and T and then T. Okay, so this gives us the expression for the coefficient of thermal expansion. Whoops, I should have said T and P, sorry. All right. So it's NR over PV, or in other words, it's 1 over T. All right, it has units of uh, Kelvin to the minus 1. All right. Now we'll do the isothermal compressibility. So that's going to be minus 1 over V times D of V of T and P. And now we want the derivative with respect to pressure. Okay. So that comes out to be NRT over P squared V. But NRT over V is P, so this is actually 1 over P if you wanted to simplify it. Okay? All right, so there's a couple of examples of uh, differentiation that are relevant to physical chemistry. And um, I think we'll uh, call it a day here uh, any second now. Um, next time we'll do another example and then we'll start to talk about the um, much more challenging problem of doing integration. So maybe between now and uh, Thursday you can remind yourself that differentiation is easy, integration is hard, and we'll see some examples of that next time. They seem like they're you know, 
integration is like anti-differentiation, but for some reason that turns out to be a lot harder than differentiation. So we'll, we'll get a, a reminder of that next time. Okay, so see you then.